Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming here. We're very excited to um, host the um, new small business rules and other federal, contract, federal laws impacting government contracts. We want to welcome you here in the audience. And then also, we have numerous people through, throughout the United States listening in, watching in on a webcast. So we also welcome you. I have a few house. My name is Michelle Cantor. I'm an attorney here at McDonald Hopkins. I'm the head of the um, the federal government practice group um, for our, our, um, our, our offices throughout the U.S. And um, with me is John Renner of the SBA, and I'm going to give you more of a, his bio in a minute, as well as Eunice Sip of NASA. So we're really honored and pleased to have them as our panelists. Um, if I may go on. Um, uh, we, we'll, we're happy to answer any questions from the audience during the program. For those of you here in the Cleveland audience, you can simply write your question down in, on one of the cards you were given and just hold it up and someone from our McDonald Hopkins staff will deliver it to us. For our participants outside on the webcast you're what, and you're watching live, um, you're welcome to also submit your questions by clicking on the green chat icon on the right side of your monitor or mobile device. If you submitted questions in advance of the program, we plan to cover those questions during our discussion to get today. We <coughs> promise we're going to conclude at 1.30. If you have any additional questions, please um, feel free to stay around. We'll be happy to answer them. Um, you can also continue to write your questions on the chat. Um, in, um, or come onto our website at any time and ask questions because we're always monitoring this and all the questions will go to us and then we can answer them. So feel free to answer questions after the words. Um, so I think um, what we want to do is let me get out. I just want to introduce our esteemed guests in a little more detail if you don't mind. So we have Eunice Sipp, um, from, is the Small Business Specialist for Nassau Glen Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. And she's responsible for promoting and in integrating small businesses into the competitive base of contractors that pioneer the future of space exploration, scientific discovery, and aeronautic research. She assists in assuring that small businesses in all socioeconomic categories receive adequate consideration in the procurement process. Additionally, she represents the agencies in various events sponsored by Congress, the SBA, and other governmental organizations to counsel small businesses on how to compete for government contracts. Ms. Adam Sipp has 26 years of experience as a contracting professional and has advised several source evaluation boards as a contracting officer in the procurement process. She's earned a ma Master of Business degree from University of Phoenix and a Bachelor of Arts and, and Economics from Cleveland State University. She's also a Chicago native but lives in, here in Cleveland. John Renner on my, um, my direct, well, it's your left, my right, um, is the Supervisory Business Opportunity Specialist for the Cleveland District Small Business Administration, or SBA. He manages the SBA's government contracting programs for the 26 northern counties covered in the Cleveland District. These programs create opportunities for small businesses in federal contracting with a focus on diverse businesses. During John's 28 years at the SBA, he has also managed the statewide Small Business Development Center network and has operated a storefront business focused, focused assistance center in Cleveland. Prior to the SBA, John worked in sales and marketing for both large and small businesses and has uh, owned two small businesses himself. I've known John for a few years now, and he's just awesome. And so and those of you who aren't talking to him at the SBA here in Cleveland, I suggest you reach out to them. And I'm just getting to know uh, Enos, too, so, uh, uh, so I hope you'll also reach out to her. So what we're going to do is we're going to start the presentation by a, um, by a PowerPoint slideshow. Um, which, you know, based upon the slideshow, you might have some questions. And then we're going to go into panel discussion um, where um, our panelists will answer questions, me included, um, from all of you, from the audience um, that has, um, from the audience that has also sent in questions. So um, I'm going to start. I normally stand up for this, and it might be better to do that, but um, we'll see. So, oh, a little bit about my, my me and my group. Um, so I've been a, 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 a government contract attorney for close to 30 years. Um, I represent women, minority, veterans, 8As, hub zones, uh, DBE businesses throughout the United States, helping them with government contracting, helping them with certification and appeals, helping in bid protests, size protests, NAICS code protests, helping them get money from the government for requests for equitable adjustment, 
dealing with prime subcontract disputes, and also working with large businesses, helping them work with small businesses and doing it the right way. Um, our fed there's a federal government contracting brochure um, on, on, the, uh, on the desk there that tells a little bit more about our group and what we do. So today we're going to focus on a lot of SBA new rules because they're very, they're new and they're exciting. They just got implemented, they just got enacted and implemented this past year. And uh, I think I better stand up for this. And so, um, and so we want to talk today, we're going to talk today about something called the limitations of subcontracting. We're going to talk today about the SBA rules on affiliation and the new exclusions from affiliation. And then the new all small business mentor protege program. So what is this limitation of subcontracting? Well, as you know, as you may know, um, the government sets aside contracts for small businesses. They do it in two different types of ways. They either restrict competition to just certain category of small businesses. For instance, they might restrict competition to just women-owned small businesses. So they may say, hey, we need landscaping services, but we're going to restrict the competition so only women-owned small businesses can actually compete. Well, that's great because you're not competing against the big businesses and you're not competing against veteran businesses and all businesses. It's just amongst yourself. So it helps level the playing field and it helps you get a better opportunity to, to, to achieve contracting success. The government also sole sources work, and that basically means no bid, no competition. You've got um, the relationship, uh, the government believes that you're the right uh, contracting firm to do the work, you negotiate the price with the government, and you perform the contract. That's called sole source. Everybody wants sole source contracts. 8A um, contracting firms historically have been able to get sole source contracts um, because um, the contracting officers are allowed to sole source to them um, without justification. It's just, it's over a certain dollar, it's under a certain dollar amount, but it's still up to several million dollars. So it's great stuff. But there's something called a limitation of subcontracting because the federal government says if we're going to give you small business contracts and sole source contracts, you got to be the ones doing them, right? We don't want you to simply, you know, flow through or pass through those contracts to other large businesses, especially. And so they, ha up until now, there was a rule. It's called the limitation of subcontracting, and there's still a rule, but it's the same rule. But I mean. The, the, rule, the FAR is still the same, but the, the rule has changed, let's just say. So FAR 5219 restricts the small business from subcontracting large portions of work. Um, so in, in, in the, both the FAR and the SBA regulations stated up until now that if, you're, if we're going to give you, for instance, a technology contract, you have to perform at least 50% of the cost of the work with your own employees. Okay, You can't be subcontracting it to 1099 contractors and you can't be subcontracting it out more than 50 percent and then um, and that's if you're in services general construction um, the rule was that you must the prime general contractor must perform at least 15 percent of the cost of the contract with its own employees and specialty trade contracts must perform 25 percent of the cost of the contract and if you're in manufacturing must perform 50 percent of the cost of the manufacturing so that ha rule has now changed and it's it's changed dramatically so let's go to what the new rule says. And, that this, um, and this was effective um, June 30th, 2016. The new rule says that in case of services, and this is for all small business set-asides, whether it's hub zone, woman-owned, 8A, SDVOSB, meaning service disabled veteran-owned small business, um, in the case of a contract for services, you cannot, you can't, no more than 50% of the amount paid by the government to the prime may be paid to firms at any tier that are not similarly situated. So that's dramatically different language from what we just saw. So I'm going to go into explaining that to you. But basically what they're saying is that now we're going to look at the total payments that the, prime, that the government has made to the prime contractor and the prime contractor cannot pay out more than 50 percent uh, of, uh, of what they've received from the federal government to their small business contractors unless those small business contractors are similarly situated, which I'll go into. Um, so the same rule is now, I, I, I talked about the uh, services part of the rule, but this is the techno I'm sorry, the general construction. The new rule says in the case of a contract for general construction, no more than 85% of the amount paid by the government to the prime may be paid to firms at any tier that are not similarly situated. And the same thing for specialty trade, it's now 75% uh, restriction. 
So how to meet the similarly situated entities and what it are, is. So this new rule basically says it calculates, it's a new calculation on limitation of subcontracting. The small business prime can subcontract to a similarly situated entity to meet the required percentage of work. The, small, uh, the, the, the similarly situated entity must share the same business program meaning that if it's a veteran-owned firm who's a prime contractor, it could subcontract to other veteran firms, okay? And that, that other small business must also be small for the NAICS code assigned to that procurement. So here's an example, hub zone firm. So let's say I'm a technology service provider and I'm a hub zone firm. So I cannot subcontract more than 50% of my work and services to, uh, to any other firm unless, uh, oh, I'm sorry, any other firm. However, if I cannot meet that 50% limitation, what I could do is I could find another veteran-owned firm, I'm sorry, another uh, hub zone firm, and, I, and that hub zone firm can meet that limitation. So let's say that I really feel like I could really only perform about 40% of the work. I could find another hub zone firm to perform 10% of that work and subcontract to the hub zone firm, and thus I've met my limitation of subcontracting that way. And the same thing with a service disabled veteran contract, the same thing with an 8A, and the same thing with a woman owned small, as woman owned small business. So for instance, if, I, if I'm in, in, uh, in a specialty trade contract, I might be an electrical contractor and I have to meet the 15%, right? I cannot pay out more than 15%. Well, then I can, uh, um, well, because I'm a woman-owned small business, I could find another woman-owned small business electrical contractor, and she could help me meet that limitation of, 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 of uh, that subcontracting limitation. So what the, the, the SBA did is they designed this to add capacity, to help you, encourage you to bid on contracts, find other small businesses that are in your category, and team with them, and we'll talk a little bit more about teaming, and so that you could feel more comfortable performing the contract and you could still meet that limitation of subcontracting. Only first tier subcontractors can be utilized to meet this limitation of subcontracting. So let's talk about new rules on exceptions from affiliation. Um, um, I looked at the guest list for, at least, uh, for, the, for many of you, in, even out in the um, webcast, and, Many of you are, all, are, also, are already in federal contracting, so I know, know a lot of these concepts. But just in case you don't, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about affiliation and what that is. So, the, so small business is defined exclusively by the SBA, okay? And, and what they do is they take the um, U.S. Consensus North American Classification Codes and they assign sm um, size standards to them. So all, small bus uh, all businesses are either large or small based upon their gross receipts annually over three years or an employee count depending on what type of industry they are. So the SBA defines small business as, for instance, in general construction, you, you would be, if your average gross receipts are um, under $36.5 million, over th average gross receipts over three years under $36.5 million for, for your firm and those of your affiliates, okay? So what they do is they're adding the gross receipts of your affiliated firms, and if those gross rece receipts uh, um, are, uh, in, are above $36.5 million, you will not be deemed a small business. Okay, so there's other types of affiliation that arises, and that arises through, for instance, contractual relationships or family relationships. And what the SBA does is it says, look, because you're affiliated, for instance, with your small business, con with, your, with your contractors on this, for instance, on a project, and you're actually, you know, there, you're, you've got other businesses supporting you in an improper way, we're going to deem you affiliated and we're no longer going to, you're no longer going to be eligible for an award of a contract. And so these are some new rules on exceptions from affiliation. So the new rule for exception for affiliation is a joint venture of two or more businesses concerns may submit an offer as a small business for a federal procurement subcontractor as long as each concern is small under the NAICS code assigned to the procurement or to the contract. So even if the NAICS code assigned to the contract is a NAICS code for which you're, um, you have to be under 15 million, if you're uh, without this rule, because you do 14 million, you do 14 million, you could be above that size standard and not be able to be awarded the contract. But the, this SBA n rule clarifies that each of you just have to be small under the NAICS code assigned for the contract, and you could then joint venture for a small business set aside. 
So new rules on affiliation. This is effective June 30th, 2016, a new rule of presumption of affiliation due to family relationships. A lot of small businesses actually have brothers and sisters and family members in other businesses or related businesses because you know, a lot of small businesses support each other. Well, the new rule says married couples, parties to a civil union, parents, children, and siblings are presumed to be affiliated with each other if they conduct business with each other. So what does conducting business mean? It means if you're subcontracting with each other, if you're joint venturing with each other, financial assistance such as loans and other financial resources, sharing equipment, sharing locations, or sharing employees. That presumption can over be, o only be overcome by a clear line of fracture. And so it's, it's, it's basically people who are doing business with their family members really should consult with your accountants and your attorneys about this because it could really impact your ability to remain eligible for small business set-asides. This is a new SBA size appeal decision um, from February 2017. Um, this is what the SBA said. In examining whether there's a clear line of fracture, the SBA may consider other factors, whether the concern shares officers, directors, employees, facilities, equipment, whether they have different customers or lines of businesses, or um, whether there's financial assistance, loans, or significant subcontracting between them, and whether the family members participate in multiple businesses together. It's not necessary to conclude that one concern exercises control over the other in order to find uh, affiliation based upon family relationships. The family relationship itself gives rise to the, to the presumption. So another SBA new rule, affiliation by control, it's called the 70% rule. Is if, the company, the company is de, if the company is dependent on a customer for more than 70% of its gross revenues from its customer for the past three years, there's a presumption that they're affiliated. So um, the result is they'll add the gross receipts from your firm or the small business firm and that of the customers. And, um, and there's really only one exception, and that is if it's a new firm. So sometimes small businesses get, you know, many times small businesses get into business and they wait, may wait a whole year or more to even get one contract because only one company is willing to give them a chance. Well, the SBA realizes that and they say, look, if 100% or 70% of your revenues just coming from one firm and you're a new firm, we get that. But after a few years, and certainly many years, if 70% of your revenues are coming from one business, that means that you're unduly reliant or dependent on that business, and therefore we're going to deem you affiliated with that business. So, new game-changing rules, the Mentor-Protege All Small Business uh, uh, Program. So, uh, in the past, the SBA had a Mentor-Protege Program, it was a very good Mentor-Protege Program, but it was only for 8A contractors. <coughs> um, but as of July 25th, an effective this past June, August 24, 2016, the program now allows for service-disabled veteran firms, women-owned, economically disadvantaged women-owned small businesses, hub zones, and small businesses to be and participate in the Mentor-Protege program. So the SBA's policy on the Mentor-Protege program is it was designed to enhance the capability of protege firms, requires approved mentors to provide business development assistance to protege firms, and to improve the protege firm's ability to successfully compete in federal contracts. Mentors are encouraged to provide assistance relating to the performance of contracts set aside or reserved for small business firms so the protégés may fully develop their capabilities. So that's the reason for the program. And um, so let's go into the, the, the various um, uh, various great things about the program. And that is um, what type of assistance? What are the protege benefits? Well, the protege benefits are assistance from normally a large business mentor. And that assistance could come as business development assistance. They, the mentor could potentially help small the small business with their marketing needs, their capability statements. They can go on conferences together and market together. They could look at um, their website materials and just basically upgrade their marketing materials, okay? And then there's technical assistance. Technical assistance may be project management assistance. It might be software assistance, helping with a new estimating software or a logistics type of software. It could be helping in, uh, in understanding the e-verify system 
for the federal government, in any type of technical assistance that the, the protege might need. And then there is financial assistance. Financial assistance can be business, could be loans. It could be investing in the small business firm, basically taking an equity stake in the small business. <coughs> and it could be introducing the small business to the, the large businesses' banking relationships. Here's another example. A lot of small businesses cannot effectively compete because they don't have the buying power for supplies, for instance, as large businesses. So maybe a large business introduces the small business to its suppliers and, and says, hey, give my guy the same type of courtesy discounts because they're a protege. All right, so that might be an example of, um, of how the financial assistance could really benefit uh, your firm and help you increase revenues. Um, and then there's an affiliation exception. A large business, so two small businesses can joint venture together and work together on small business set-asides, but a small, a large businesses can never joint venture with a small business on a, on a small business set-aside. And the exception is, because they're deemed affiliated, but the exception is when it, they're an approved mentor-protege program, then the mentor can basically, can joint venture with a small business and go after small business set-asides together. And that's really big deal for large business joint uh, large businesses when they mentor, because that when, especially when they're going after larger projects, they want to have a little more control of the projects, and they don't just want to be a subcontractor to a small business. They'd rather be a partner or a joint venture partner in as a prime contractor, so they have more control over the business or or the joint venture project, and they could better help you manage that project. Um, and so others are revenue from subcontracting. As a small business, you're allowed to subcontract work to your mentor. And so that's new revenues to um, large businesses that they wouldn't ordinarily have because it's a small business set aside. Um, they are not entitled to, for reimbursement um, for their time mentoring. And they are allowed up to a 40% ownership stake into the protege. So, I want to talk about that because uh, I like, get a lot of calls from all over the country with large businesses saying to me, Michelle, I want a mentor and I intend to take an equity stake in this small business firm. That's fine and it's allowable by the rules. Um, there has to be full disclosure to the SBA. But just, just think to yourself, if you're, if you're, especially if you're that small business and you happen to be DBE certified or MBE certified or WBE certified. Um, so. The, the states and the local agencies around the country don't net recognize this mentor-protege program. And as you see, the mentor-protege program is normally one year up to three years and ultimately six years. What happens after that sixth year? You've got a large business that has an investment in your small business firm. And for instance, if you're DBE certified, even from day one, they may, they may well not recognize this, and you could be decertified with your other certifications. So you who are large businesses and, wanna, um, and want to mentor uh, small business, I strongly encourage you to do that. But when you're looking to take an equity stake in that small business, Talk to uh, knowledgeable legal counsel about the rules because you might think you're taking an equity stake into a DBE firm, but that DBE firm can then lose their status for that because it's an SBA rule. It's not a USDOT DBE regulation. Who can be a mentor? Qualifications. Well, any large or small business could be a mentor. There must be a commitment to act as a mentor. Um, does the, the SBA require the mentor to have federal contract experience? No, it does not. And the general rule is one protege at a time. Now the SBA will allow a second uh, a protege for a mentor, but it has to make sense to the SBA. For instance, if the SBA was allowing you, you're a Cleveland contractor, and the SBA, um, and you're in, for instance, general contracting, and the NAICS code is 236220, for instance, um, then, uh, and the mentor is looking at another um, woman-owned firm or veteran-owned firm in the same Cleveland area, that could be a competition. So the, the, basically the protégés are going to be competing against each other for small business set-asides. The SBA doesn't want that conflict, okay? So there, but, for instance, um, there was a situation where the SBA allowed a mentor that was out of California to mentor one firm in Arizona and another firm that did, did exclusive work in Guam because that made sense. They weren't competing against each other. Protege qualifications. The protege must be small in his primary NAICS code 
or is seeking to do business uh, d d business develop oh, I'm sorry is seeking business development assistance under a secondary NAICS code. So what if the protege has no prior experience under the secondary NAICS code or North American Classification Code? The SBA says no. They have to have some experience, and they, we want the, the mentor to be able to take that some experience and grow that experience into, um, in, into being a qualified, general contra uh, qualified um, federal contractor. How many mentors can I have? Well, generally the SBA only wants you to have one mentor at a time. And believe me, if you're in a robust mentor-protege relationship, you don't want more than one mentor at a time because that's a lot of answering questions and you're trying to run your own staff and do your own business and run out in the field. So normally, the SBA will allow you to have another mentor. So here's a for instance, maybe you, 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 your, your business is selling services and supplies. So you might have one mentor in helping you install carpeting and the other mentor in, in basically how to manufacture or fabricate certain uh, tile materials. That might be a situation because they're totally different type of mentoring processes. Um, so if I'm pro um, am I protected from a bid protest if I pursue a contract as a joint venture mentor protege? And the answer is not necessarily. So the SBA, the great thing about the mentor protege relationship and this joint venturing is the SBA says that we will not deem the mentor and the protege affiliated because, as, because just because the mentor is providing assistance under an approved mentor protege relationship but they can find affiliation for different reasons. So be very careful when you're pre preparing these joint, I'm sorry, these mentor protege agreements and ultimately going after contracts on the federal level together because if your mentor protege agreement doesn't contemplate the type of assistance the mentor's giving you on a project that might be in California or in Florida, then you may be subject to affiliation because it's not the, the approved assistance, the me, it's not the assistance the SBA approved under the SBA mentor protege arrangement. So the mentor protege could be up to three years. They want to see at least one year, but you could extend for an additional two years. And ultimately, um, the cap is six years. Uh, and both parties can terminate with 30 days prior written notice. So here's an example in the mentor protege template of the types of assistance. The, the, and they say management technical assistance, financial assistance, contracting assistance, <coughs> and other assistance. And then they want to know the timeline. And this is really good to know and review because this maybe spark questions between you and a prospective protege or prospective mentor. It's like, okay, this is the type of assistance I need. Let's talk about the timelines, and I have another slide on that. So um, I, I do want to just tell you that the mentor, the SBA in its new All Small Business Mentor Protege Program, has said that you, uh, that if you if you if you basically if the mentor fails to provide the assistance contained in the SBA Mentor Protege arrangement, they could terminate the Mentor Protege arrangement. They could um, uh, they could bar the uh, the mentor from participating in the Mentor Protege Program. They can issue a stop work order on that project so they could start investigating what's going on. They could terminate the mentor from the project as long as the protege can, is still capable of performing the work on its own. Or they could actually suspend or debar the, uh, the, the large business mentor. So be careful. Mentor-protege relationships must be legitimate and it needs to be done for the right purpose. Proteges with no capacity or expertise may well be bid protested. It's a very competitive world out there and people know who their competitors are and, um, and you will see more and more bid protests where the protege really doesn't have that uh, capacity or expertise but going after a project anyway. Um, the larger the project, the likelihood of scrutiny. And just for you small businesses as well as large businesses out there, um, if it doesn't feel right, this mentor-protege thing, ask questions, seek guidance. So the first thing, to, the first thing to, to take into consideration when you're looking at mentor-protege is the needs assessment. So you, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I'm going to be in a mentor-protege and now I'm going to grow my business to $10 million. But it's got to make sense to the SBA and it has to be based upon your business development plan, how you want to develop your business and what are your needs. So what they want the mentor and encourage the mentor and protege do, to do is do a needs assessment. So basically it's where the protege articulates or, or the and mentor and protege get together and the mentor asks the protege, what do you need? 
What type of business development assistance do you need? What kind of contracting assistance do you need? What kind of project management assistance do you need? Financial assistance. And the protege could probably list 50 things that they need, right? They need help in QA, QC. They need help in, in uh, mo modifying their employee manual. They need help in the compliance program. And the, the, the mentor then looks at the list of 50 things and said, yeah, I agree, you need these. But this is what I'm willing to do. Because why, why say, sure, I'll do all those 50 things when you know that's not going to happen? Mm -hmm. So it has to be realistic. And the two of you agree upon what the mentor will do for you and the timeline for that assistance. So, that, so the mentor knows that, look, you've got a year to accomplish this training. And how, so you could start talking about the, the mechanics of getting it done. So those are the practical considerations. Other practical considerations also is, is the mentor in Chicago, yet the protégés in Atlanta? Well, how, what type of hands-on assistance is going to happen? Versus a mentor here in Cleveland and the protégé being here in Cleveland, and the mentor and protégé owners could go out for lunch once a month or once a week and talk about what's going on operationally. And, and the mentor could help, uh, the, the protege might say, I'm having some um, uh, problems with my employees. What, what's your suggestion? So there's hands-on mentoring. Or the, the protege can go over to the mentor's businesses, maybe it's a manufacturing plant, and watch the way they do it. Watch the, the way they do process improvement or Six Sigma improvement and get hands-on training. It's very difficult and very t um, costly to send your, let's say your protege, to send seven of your employees over to the mentor's offices in Seattle for two or three weeks to get training. Right? It really costs you, it will cost you a lot of money. So those are the practical considerations. And then timeline, we talked about timeline. It needs to be a realistic timeline. As, and then the legal considerations are just understand that a mentor-protege arrangement is just that. It's an agreement whereby the mentor promises to provide assistance to the protege, and the protege promises to take that assistance and, and cooperate, right? And, uh, but it is not a joint venture agreement. And I've seen a lot of people that enter into mentor-proteges and get their mentor-protege approval and believe they're now in a legal joint venture agreement. They actually, I've gotten questions from people that says uh, that, that basically uh, a protege believes that the mentor cannot work with any other small businesses except themselves. Or the, pro or the mentor doesn't want the protege working with any other small businesses. I'm sorry, with any other large businesses. Rest assured that there are a lot of laws involved in that, and that's antitrust laws that you have to be aware of. And so nobody should restrict a small business's ability to do work with somebody else, and nobody should restrict a large business's ability to do work with anyone else. So mentor-protege joint venture rules, the new rules. Basically, the joint ventures must be in writing, and uh, the performance of work is that the protege must perform at least 40% of the work performed by the joint venture. So in my, in my original, um, in this limitations of subcontracting scenario, let's say that the joint venture has to perform 15% of the work of the, uh, to the government. All right, They actually have to at least self-perform that, be paid that under the limitations of subcontracting, or not pay out more than that. But um, what you need to know is that under the mentor-protege joint venture relationship, the protege must perform at least 40% of that 15%. And then the uh, mentor can perform 60% of that 15%. Or more, if they want. The small business could perform more. All small business joint venture and new rules. So the a definition of a joint venture is when two, this is the SBA's definition, Two or more concerns in any degree or percentage agrees to engage and carry out no more than three business ventures over a two-year period. They call that, you'll hear that from contracting officers as well, the three and two rule. That means that you can only perform three joint ventures with your joint venture partners over a two-year period. Now, you could bid on as many contracts as you want because you may, not, uh, you may not win the bids, but you could only perform those three joint ventures over a two-year period. Now, if, if the, uh, or, or you could only be awarded those uh, three joint ventures over a two-year period. Now, can, does that mean you have to stop working with your joint venture partner? No, you just need to create a new joint venture. But that's the three and two rule. And if the three and two rule is violated, the SBA will deem the firms affiliated. They'll add your gross receipts together. You're no longer a small business and eligible for a small business set aside.
And they say, but not on a continuing and permanent basis for the, con for the purpose of conducting business generally. So what I want to let you know, and I know this has happened, a lot of small businesses entered into joint ventures, let's say three years ago, and they incorporated them as limited liability companies, and maybe they did one small project, but they, they left the incorporation with the Secretary of State, and it's going on and on and on, three years, five years, ten years. So it, doesn't that mean that they're doing business permanently? So be very careful when your joint venture is ended and the project's closed out, you need to basically dissolve that joint venture limited liability company or corporation with the Secretary of State so you're not deemed affiliated into the future. Because rest assured, your competitors are watching you. Um, so new SBA rule on populated versus unpopulated joint ventures. So first of all, what is it? So in the past, the SBA allowed one small business to joint venture with another small business and create a third small business, okay? So what happens is they, the SBA said, well, you could have a populated joint venture or an unpopulated joint venture. A populated joint venture is when both businesses kept their own employees and they kept doing their own work and the joint venture actually hired employees and the joint venture performed all the work. That's called a populated joint venture. And then there's the unpopulated joint venture where the joint venture is really kind of a core or shell company and it subcontracts work to both joint venture partners. The SBA likes that better because it could then, through the subcontracts, could really see what each business is doing, especially under the mentor-protege scenario. So before you enter into a joint venture agreement, always perform, or any agreement, always perform a risk, um, a risk analysis. And what do I mean by that? In any contract, you ask yourself before you sign the contract, before you draft the contract, before you negotiate a contract, whether it's a joint venture contract, a subcontract, or a supply agreement, ask yourself what can possibly go wrong, besides everything. Okay, so what could possibly wrong? Physical risks. What are physical risks? That's people getting hurt, let's say it's a construction project, or, um, or property getting damaged. Um, that, that it happens all the time on construction projects. Financial risk, financial risk that maybe the government or the customer is not going to pay you on time and do you have enough in your line of credit to carry your employees and pay them on time? I mean, that's the financial risk. The financial risks are, 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 you know, maybe there's bank loans involved and maybe the bank's not being as cooperative as you believe the bank would be. Um, feasibility risks, you look at the plans and specifications and you say, can this actually be done? Can I construct this thing for the federal government? Can I construct this building with the plans and specifications the government has given me? Or are they defective? And I can't possibly do it under this time frame because they're defective. So that's feasibility. And then what are the warranties? I mean, you might know that your, your supplier may be giving you a one-year warranty, but maybe the government's asking for a five-year warranty. So how are you going to handle that risk? And then other liabilities and potential losses. You're looking at your, your joint venture partners and you're saying, what other liabilities or potential losses can I, we see if we perform this project? Whether it's a $200 million um, uh, transmission project or it's a $50,000 janitorial service project. What are the risks? And then I suggest you address those risks in your joint venture agreements. Okay, because every joint venture agreement should contain the expectations of each parties. Because the bottom line is if you believe that you are basically a subcontractor to the joint venture and one joint venture partner believes that you each are going to get your, um, you're going to invoice every two weeks, the other joint venture believes that you're going to invoice at once a month, but one joint venture partner is the managing joint venture, meaning the 51% owned joint venture, they're going to rule. They're going to say, what, what's going to be the bottom line. And so now your expectations are not being met. So make sure that the joint venture con agreement contains all your expectations because the bottom line is if they're not there, the other party doesn't have to do it. So what are common problems I see in joint venture agreements? Using other companies' forms that are found on the internet, using templates without modifying them to address the specific projects, and they don't identify the risks, the rights, and the expectations of both parties. Federal business teaming. So we talked about sole source, and every, every small business is entitled to sole source work, meaning woman-owned small business, economically disadvantaged small business, hub zone 8A, and service disabled veteran. Set aside restricted competition to only those categories of businesses. And then the federal government has some special preferences. One is under the VA FIRST program, 
veterans take first, meaning that the VA must search out, do market research to see if there are any veterans out there that could perform the work at a fair and reasonable price. If there are, the VA must set it aside or sole source to a veteran. So that's what's really difficult for a lot of contractors out there that are especially in like the medical supply business uh, or other medical businesses that uh, may not have been service disabled veterans, but they were hub zoned or 8A or women owned that really cannot be par participate for all intents and purposes in VA contracts anymore. We're gonna see a lot of legal challenges on that and, and other, and other um, issues come up on that. So, and then there's something called a price evaluation. Hub zone preference, hub zone firms get 10% price evaluation. So if you're, it's open competition and you're a hub zone firm and you bid 110,000, but another non-hub zone firm bids 100,000, you actually could take the, what you could be the winner. So that's a great price preference. So know your teaming partner. Um, teaming is encouraged by the federal government. And what I mean by teaming, there's just two, simply two, two different ways to team. One way is uh, where you're the prime contractor and you have a contract with the federal government and you have a subcontractor that's on your team. And we call it a team because normally the two of you actually work together to prepare a bid proposal so you have the best opportunity to win. And that subcontractor is not bidding to other businesses. They're only bidding to you and brainstorming with you so you have the best opportunity to, 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 see, to obtain the award of the contract. And then the other type of teaming is joint venturing. And that's when basically two businesses get together, whether it's a mentor protege or two small businesses, and they act as a prime contractor to the federal government. Um, what information should be contained in my teaming agreement? Well, you want to identify the team members, the purpose of the, of, of the teaming agreement, the roles, each one's, uh, the roles each one to play, who's going to have communications with the government, what, what is your source of labor, who's going to be doing what, are you going to comply with your limitations of subcontracting, what's the term of the teaming agreement, you want to address confidentiality because the two of you are sharing information that you don't want to have disclosed to your competitors. Um, who's going to be responsible for false statements? Let's say your teaming partner tells you that, that and you're preparing a proposal to do a facility maintenance um, in um, high security technology contracts. And, uh, and you've got, um, and your, uh, your teaming partner gives you resumes from its staff from, and all the staff is from MIT but you later find out that none of the staff is from MIT. So you've now, because you've submitted this bid together, you've now um, created a false statement to the federal government. So you want to address that because you might not necessarily know your teaming partner as, mu uh, as well as you should know them. Uh, and then jurisdiction and disputes. So if, the, if you and your teaming partner is in Cleveland, make sure, God forbid, if there is a dispute, the dispute's not being heard in New York City or California because it could cost you a lot of money to, do, to litigate there or arbitrate there in another, in another city. So uh, we're going to talk about discussions for, uh, on, on prospective teaming partners. And, uh, and, and I want to actually do that by asking our panel some questions. So if you bear with me. And do we have any questions yet from the audience, from this audience? So <clears throat> I'm going to start with John. Um, who reviews and approves mentor-protege agreements under the new Small Business Mentor-Protege Program? The Small Business Administration does. Um, and as opposed to the Mentor-Protege Program under the 8A Small Business Development Program, uh, which, which has local uh, interaction with, with those agreements. We don't touch them here locally at all. It's all done at a national level at headquarters. And I heard that the time for approval of the Mentor-Protege uh, agreements are pretty rapid. Um, do you have any idea about how fast they're approving these submissions? The latest information I've heard is that they're running 20 to 30 days. On, on approvals once all of the information is in and that's always the, uh, the little asterisk there there can be some back and forth of course on any of our programs uh, of requesting additional information for clarification and um, what happens if uh, <coughs> the SBA rejects a mentor protege submission are they rejected forever or can they reapply uh, there is a, a reconsideration period of I believe it's 45 days and then if there's still a decline there the mentor and protege have to wait six months to apply again to the program. 
So there's always an opportunity to apply, uh, to go back and apply. Can you explain a little bit about the approval process? Oh, I'm going to, I wanted a few more joint uh, mentor protege. Okay. Does the mentor and protege have to be registered in SAM, which is System Award Management? Yes, prior to uh, applying or submitting the agreement for the mentor protege program, both the mentor and protege must be in SAM. And that goes to everybody in this room and everybody out there. If you're interested in doing business with the federal government, number one piece is SAM.gov. You must go to SAM.gov, System for Award Management, and get your business registered. It's kind of putting yourself out there as an interested party in doing federal contracting. John, I'm um, going to stick on mentor protege here okay. for a while, but uh, what are the reasons that joint ventures and mentor protege arrangements get declined, to your knowledge? Well, th one of the main reasons is that it's lacking some of the detail that is being requested as part of the application, and that the team of the mentor and the protege do not get that information back. So non-response, unfortunately, is the number one reason uh, for decline. Another important reason is that SBA has made a determination that in fact the, the mentor is not providing the protege with enough assistance in order to justify <coughs> um, approving the agreement, meaning that it, it appears in some cases that the mentor is simply attempting to get a piece of the small business pie um, by using a small business and of course that that does occur and I think that everybody who's entering a mentor protege agreement obviously needs to do you know their 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 due diligence to make sure that uh, the the team is appropriate that you really both can uh, gain benefit from the agreement and that one party's not going to be taking advantage of another one um, one question, more question to you on the on mentor protege. Do you need to, an approved mentor protege before a bid is submitted? Yes. <laughs> Correct? Yes, you need, <laughs> it, it gets a little gray there. You need to have an approved mentor protege before a bid is submitted, but of course you're going to be submitting a bid most likely with a joint venture which needs to be approved by the time of award. Right, that's very correct. So Eunice, it's my understanding that NASA actually has its own mentor-protege program. Yes. Can you discuss that a little bit? Um, and then we're gonna ask you about a lot about NASA. But, uh. <laughs> okay, so um, NASA has its own mentor-protege mentor program that's separate from the SBA's uh, mentor-protege program. And the primary uh, reason for the mentor protege program with NASA is to assist elig eligible small businesses um, to perform as a prime, as a subcontractor, or as a supplier um, to NASA. Uh, the mentors actually incur costs when they're providing developmental assistance, and they and the incentive for a large business to uh, mentor a small business is they receive credit towards their subcontracting goals. So all of our large businesses uh, that have contracts with NASA over $750,000 uh, are required to have submit their subcontracting goals and, their, their, and they are um, actually entered and we monitor their, their, the progress that they make um, during contract performance. Uh, the eligibility for um, a mentor is that, well, first of all, I should say NASA also has a list of approved mentors and they are on the Office of Small Business Program website. Um, the large business must have a contract, a current contract with uh, NASA and have a subcontracting plan. Um, they must be eligible to receive uh, go uh, government contracts. And then the protege is self-certified. They have, they usually have a relationship with the, the mentor. They must apply um, to the program uh, through the small business office, the local small business office at NASA. And um, they may only participate twice in the program and they may maintain the small business 
small business status throughout the life of the agreement. So if a small business ends up becoming large under the NAICS code that they're in, and when they first applied they were small, they will be ma maintained as small through the, through the Medicare yeah. Can you, everybody uh, asked me, I was so, everyone was so excited when we heard you're going to be on the panel. They say, wow, I do technology work, I do facility maintenance work. Will NASA hire me? Could you give us an idea of what NASA buys? Okay, NASA buys everything. We buy everything from toilet paper to the shuttle. So it's a whole <laughs> wide range of things that we buy, and a lot of people do ask me that. But the, the main thing uh, about uh, when you're doing business with NASA and you're looking to do contracting with NASA is that they're actually, we have nine centers and then the, uh, we have JPL, which, is, which can be is a quasi um, a governmental agency. The, the main thing to, that you need to do is to make sure that you know what each center does. So every center has its own, uh, they have some things that are common and other things that are not common. So to make, the main thing, thing to do is to make sure that you're aware of what each center does. And, um, and also then make contact, start to make contact with the small business specialist at that center because the small business specialist is aware of the different procurements that are going on at the at that particular center and they can give you more information about what's available. Um, I spoke at a small business conference in Phoenix once when a contracting officer told us, this was for Luke Air Force Base, she says nobody does construction work on my Air Force Base my, um, because she's very proud of it mm -hmm. unless I've met them through a capabilities presentation. So they encourage capabilities presentations. Can you talk a little bit about that and how if I want to meet your contracting officers how I can do a capabilities presentation to them or to you or to both and kind of what's the best way to do that? Well, each, every center is different. I know at Glenn Research Center, most of the capability presentations are done through the small business um, specialist. However, if there is a particular um, uh, uh, industry that you're in, the main thing is to, to make contact with the technical person there. Most of the, most of the contracting officers, depend, it depends on what whether or not they're in, in currently in a procurement. So they might they may be doing working in a procurement. They're starting to do their market research um, on the on what they're doing. And so now then you can get in contact with them and each one will t well everyone will tell you whether or not their their availability. Sometimes they'll meet with the with the contracting officer and a technical team or the technical person that's required, uh, that's responsible for that procurement. So each um, center, the best thing to do is to get in contact with the either the contracting officer or the small business specialist at each center and they will let you know what their protocol is at the center. And if I was going to um, do my first capability statement and you as a former contracting officer, can you give me uh, the audience some recommendations as to what you would want to see in a short five minute, three minute capability presentation? Well, I'm learning more and more about that. <laughs> uh, okay, the, the main thing is, is to give us a synopsis of what your business does. Give a, um, a little bit about your, your past performance, but not everything that you've ever done, but just the main thing, your central uh, focus of what your business is that should be on your capability statement, your NACE codes. What, make sure you do research and capture all of the NACE codes where your business will, will fit into. Make sure that's on, on your capability statement and your contact information. I've gotten um, uh, capability statements that just have the business and a number, but there's not a person on there to contact. So I think that's very important for a person that I can get in contact with so that if I have a technical person that may be interested in some IT training, then I can give you give them that information, and I have passed on information to um, to requirements people that that need more information on the business. I have another question on mentor protege. I guess to John, okay. um, the mentor protege term is capped at six years, but what if the mentor protege is a, is a joint venture and they're awarded a multi five-year contract in year five, will they still be allowed to perform the joint venture as a small business joint venture and perform the whole five years? The, the quick answer is yes. And of course, the trend in federal contracting right now is not to do one-year contracts. It's to do three, five-year, and, and even sometimes we've seen 10-year 
Uh, yep. Have you seen anything beyond 10 years? No, not beyond yeah. 10 years. 10 year contracts, <laughs> and, and certainly the awarded entity, whether it's small at the time of award, woman owned at the time of award, or a joint venture that's, that's gotten the award, is going to be able to perform that contract through the end of the contract. Yes. Okay, I had a question that I think I, think I understand the question, so I'm going to repeat it because I think it's from the audience, make sure um, I got the question right. Um, and that is, can a protege under a mentor-protege arrangement identify and bring their own choice of mentor? So I think the answer is, is that there is no requirement of who the mentor is and who the protege is. Um, under the NASA program and under Department of Defense, their mentor-protege programs, the mentor must be pre-approved as a mentor with Department of Defense or, or NASA. And that's why the mentor's names are posted on the, on the websites as pre-approved mentors. However, you as an individual party, a private party, are entitled and have to find your own mentor. And so you're not going to be required to work with any one mentor. It's what mentor you've identified or the, and the two of you Make sure you've talked and you really understand, may have lots of meetings with each other and really want to do this together. So yes, you should bring your own mentor to the mm -hmm. table, for sure. I'd, I'd like to add to that. If somebody, uh, a contracting officer or, or uh, another a competitor is suggesting a mentor for you, I would really take a very hard look. Uh, that should not be done. You've got to look at your strategic plan as a small business, see where you want to go, and what mentor is going to fit that bill the best. In my opinion, uh, I'd love to see mentors that have already done work with the small business. Maybe you've done some subcontracting with your potential mentor. Um, maybe there's some other relationships that you've seen. Maybe you run into them on job sites and started to develop this relationship. It is not something that you want to jump into overnight. This is a major commitment by both parties, and uh, you don't want to take it just because there might happen to be an opportunity out there right now. It's not that kind of a business decision. So um, here's a question that, uh, from the audience. Can two parties from a mentor-protege relationship only bid on jobs in the name of the protege with the mentor performing work as a subcontractor? There would be no joint venture. The answer is absolutely yes, um, and but just make sure that if that mentor is performing any type of very important elements of the project that you've subcontracted, that 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 type of work or assistance is provided for in your mentor-protege agreement. Because a mentor-protege agreement is just an agreement about assistance. It's, it's, it's separate from the joint venture. So if you're not going to enter into a joint venture agreement and you're going to ask that mentor to subcontract to you, that's absolutely fine. It's great, in fact. Um, it helps you grow as a prime contractor. But, um, but make sure that, that, that ment if, the, if the mentor is going to provide any unusual assistance, it should be identified in your mentor-protege agreement. Um, another uh, so question from the audience is, uh, how will new rules affect woman-owned small business self-certification? I believe what they're referring to in the audience is that there is, um, Congress wants no more self-certification for women-owned small businesses. There's been several inspector general reports that have come out, one from um, actually NASA and the other from the SBA inspector general about um, types of problems with self-certified women-owned small businesses. Um, they're not vetted and, uh, and a lot of women businesses don't really understand the eligibility criteria and so they're not really considered legitimate small businesses and there's been several um, several investigations regarding that, especially in the last couple of years. So even though Congress really wants to see and has, and has enacted legislature saying that there no women business could be self-certified and be in the WSB program, um, it's still being worked out by the SBA as to how that's going to actually shake out because the S, you know, somebody needs to do the certifications. And there is um, uh, proposals that, for instance, um, third parties other than the Women's Business Development Center or, um, um, other, or, or others uh, or the U.S. Chamber, Women's Business Chamber of Commerce can, can continue to do self-certification 
but are there other um, agencies out there that could have certified women businesses and the federal government will actually recognize them? So for instance, the city of Chicago, they have a very robust MBE, WBE procurement process. They heavily vet women business owners and, and businesses to make sure they're legitimate. So would the federal government, for instance, take their certification? That's the answer. That's, that's part of the question. And the answer is we don't know yet. We're still waiting to see with the new changes in the administration how that will really shake out. But right now, self-certification is allowed. Um, I think your best bet is to actually find a third party certifier, for instance, the Women's Business Development Center, to vet your application and get WBE certified. And so at least you have that in case you're bid protested because that certification will get uploaded to the Women Owned Small Business De Repository. Mm -hmm or ask uh, knowledgeable legal counsel or knowledgeable uh, any type of your you know any type of counsel that understands the women owned small business program and even if you're self certifying say look at my documents look at the way i in you know, my corporate structure look at my operational control my legal control do i meet the eligibility criteria as a woman owned small business and if that legal counsel says yes then you feel more comfortable self certifying with the federal government yeah. Do no, that's, that, that's reasonable. Uh, keep in mind that uh, once, once the laws are passed to make changes to these programs, it does take some time to get the rules in effect. As a matter of fact, this all small matter protege has been on the books for a couple of years and, and really just getting going now. Nationally, uh, I did want to point out we have 216 approved all small mentor proteges. This does not address the 8A program. We probably have more in the 8A program by far than 216. But when we're opening it up to all small businesses, we have 216 current approved mentor protege relationships nationwide. Uh, you'll see that accelerating, I think, as, as the word gets out more. Uh, but, uh, but that's what we have at this point. Eunice, I have an interesting question here from the uh, audience out in the webcast. Um, I believe it's from them. What is the most effective way to convince a government buyer, meaning contracting officer, that you're a good, viable business who could help them achieve their goals? Well, the, the, the thing is, though, that the NASA has and most of the federal agencies have their own um, uh, procurement process. So first of all, depending on what you're actually looking for, some of the other programs you can actually submit an unsolicited proposal. But first of all, we usually uh, will go out and you'll know that we're looking for something by um, our sources sought. So as we're um, looking for different um, uh, requirements, the sources sought will go out. The, the main thing that, that I would want to emphasize with small businesses is to answer the sources sought. Because the way that we're, what happens is when we're we're doing us a, a we're doing our market research and we find at least two companies in the socioeconomic categories that are capable of doing the work and that is another process in itself, then um, then we can actually we're asked to set those um, those requ uh, requirements aside for small businesses. But the only way we're going to know is if you let us know that you're there. The other thing is that I would like to emphasize too is, is the building of relationships because, in, and again, the, through the small business specialist, if you know what um, each of the centers are doing, then you'll then then we'll know that you're out there. So, for instance, if you're if you're an IT um, contractor and you know that you have the best IT services out there, then if you let the the small business specialist is your your gatekeeper that they're, you're letting them know that you're there, and then you can develop relationships with the technical people because usually we 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 are working on the requirements that that, that we have. Uh, we also um, do what we call an acquisition forecast. All of this is uh, public information and it's available through the best thing, best way to find out about our acquisition forecast is go through the Office, office of Small Business Programs is www.osbp.gov. On that website, er, there's a lot of information about how to do business with NASA and also the, the acquisitions that are available. All, we all are required to do an acquisition forecast that forecasts out for the 24 for 24 months as to what we anticipate that we have coming up within the, a lot I get a lot of questions about construction um, there's a lot of construction going on um, at NASA 
specifically at Glenn Research Center, but we have contracts that are already in place for that. That's some. That's what you need to know, and that's how why you contact your the small business specialist because they know they're familiar with what's going on. That contract does not end until 2020. So now you're saying, okay, so that's not what I need to do, but maybe I can develop relationships with contractors that are already there. So there. Uh, so that's the that's the type of. Um, the um, developing of relationships that you should do to for to let us know that you're out there that there's uh, there's um, you have a, a capability that you can provide us with and and then um, and then we can start talking about what you need to do as far as being getting ready with uh, to um, to go through the procurement process. So staying in touch with your small business administration, with John is the one who can help you, the, the uh, pro procurement te technical assistance centers, your women um, business center, so they can get you ready to, to bid on the on those requirements. You know, Eunice, you, you mentioned a ton of things there. I want to point out the, the procurement technical assistance centers, or PTACs, that's a program, that's a national program um, of folks that are ready and willing to help you to get ready for federal contracting. And they're, they're funded by the Department of Defense and typically the state in which they reside. They're invaluable, also come to your SBA offices. But uh, I want to take it one step further. The question was, you know, what do I do? How do I set myself apart? How do I get in the game there? Well, we're sitting here in Cleveland. We have a room full of people. I guarantee you I know at least half of you. I know you because you're serious and you come to everything and you know that Eunice is going to be here and if Eunice is a target or NASA is a target for, for your contracting and you know that somebody from NASA, Glenn's going to be in the room, you're going to show up, show your face and put your hand out. Everybody out there has to do the exact same thing. Selling to the federal government may be unique, but when it comes down to, to, to the human point, um, it's just like selling to anybody else. If Eunice knows who you are because she's seen you 10 times in the last year, she's talking to you about the contracting officers and the technical people back, back uh, at, at the center. Yeah. Um, that's how it works. Attend matchmaking events. Attend everything you can. Get your face out in front of them. I know it's difficult for, for the web audience today, but attend local events is, is one very good way to do that. Sure. It's my understanding um, that uh, all pretty much all contracts from agencies so if, if a contracting uh, agency is uh, anticipating that it's going to be doing all this work let's say forecasting in the next six months all those projects are actually being shared with the small business specialists is, isn't that true most of them, most most of them, them are mm -hmm. and so um, do the small business liaisons or specialists do they um, recommend certain contractors to the contracting officers saying, you know, you could actually set this aside for 8A or service disabled veterans because I've met them. I was just at a conference or I was just here at McDonald Hopkins and I met two 8As that could do that work. Do right. you actually t communicate with the contracting officers who may not be able to attend these types of functions, but you do? Right. Well, I, I would say where we can't uh, recommend specific contractors, we can recommend uh, uh, specific set aside. So if I know that there's two contractors out there there that are 8A that can do the work, then yes, I can say, you know what, we you should not do this as just a, a full and open or a small business set aside, but you can set it aside for 8A. And actually, if you, um, for us and and being familiar with the procurement process. We like competition, but we like to narrow the competition because if you, when you're opening up to the whole world, then you're going to get the whole world to to bid on it. But if you can give, uh, well, the, of course, opportunities for small businesses as well, but actually compete within a socioeconomic category, it makes it uh, our jobs a little easier as far as evaluating those proposals. John, another mentor protege question. Can mentor and protege be located in different states and are there geographical restrictions on contract awards based upon that? A mentor protege can be located anywhere. I think you actually addressed this a little bit. It might be a little more convenient to your relationship if you are in the proximity to each other, but it certainly in this day and age can be done. We have uh, mentor protege relationships uh, approved right here in in 
in our territory here in northern Ohio where the, the protege is local and, and the mentor has international presence and is all over the world. There is some local presence, but the, the, uh, the guiding forces of that mentor-protege relationship are in New York City. Excellent. So I, I think I'm gonna answer this. Um, where can a mentor-protege find projects that accept the program? So um, basically, once you're in an SBA approved mentor protege program, all agencies will accept will accept a joint venture together with your mentor and a protege. Okay, so you don't have to worry about that. But what what you need to know is that projects aren't set aside for just mentors and proteges. So it, you might be um, contracting on a state level, like o Ohio Department of Transportation or Wisconsin Department of Transportation, and they do have a mentor-protege DBE program. All states have DBE mentor-protege programs. In those mentor-protege programs, actually projects are set aside for mentors and proteges. On a federal level, they are not set aside for mentors and proteges. Any mentor-protege team can go after a small business set aside as long as the protege is eligible to, to, to basically uh, to, to bid or, pre or present a bid proposal for the project. And I guess if I, if I might add just a sure. little bit, it, it was not mentioned here today, but maybe there are some in the audience here and elsewhere uh, that, that aren't aware of FedBizOps, FBO.gov. Uh, is is the place where you go to look for federal government opportunities over twenty five thousand dollars and it is on fbo.gov that you're going to see what Eunice referred to earlier these sources Source sought solicitations you're going to see all kinds of different things on FBO including solicitations so it's going to say give me a bid give me a proposal or you're going to see sources sought which is again very important that small businesses of all kinds uh, respond to these sources sought solicitations so that the agency considers setting it aside for right. small, women-owned, service-disabled vet, hub zone, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another question we have is, is there a mentor list website? So once again, the <coughs> Department of Defense does list their approved mentors, so does NASA. You, you know, if you want to contact those mentors, they might be interested in mentoring an additional firm like you. But the SBA does not have an approved mentor list, okay, or any type of list. The best thing you, one of the things you might want to do, I find for my small businesses that I represent, now how do they find, how do they locate mentors? Well, here's a couple suggestions. One suggestion is PTEC, the Prote Pro Procurement Technical Assistance Center. Because although they work with small businesses, there are also no large businesses, and large businesses contact them and say, I'm looking for a protege. So they might be able to send the mentor or the protege in the right direction by letting you exchange numbers and things like that. So they might have a list of people, of various protects. Um, for instance, they, one PTAC officer said, you know, I started, I started a list of uh, mentor, potential mentors that have called me that says I'm looking for proteges. So that's a really good way to find uh, a mentor or a protege. The other thing is your accounting, your accountants. Your accountants work with large businesses and small businesses and you might want to tell your accountants that you want to find a mentor. Or a bonding company, your bonding agent for those of you in construction. They know all the large businesses and they know the small businesses and they may know some of their large business clientele might be looking for a protege. So I would contact um, your bonding agent, which we have some great ones here in the audience today. Um, you might want to talk to your attorneys. Well, a lot of law firms work with large businesses and small businesses like I do. Um, I've, I've assisted numerous large businesses identify small businesses as protégés. Um, those are just some examples. You might want to talk to your local uh, SBA office. The, they may have had inquiries from large businesses that are looking for protégés. But there is no published website um, in terms of people looking for protégés. And the SBA certainly doesn't publish approved mentors because it approves the mentor and the protégé at the same time for that particular basically application. So they just don't approve mentors to be mentors. They will approve a mentor to be a mentor to a protege for specific assistance. You know, I have one more source that's great. You know, federal contracting is by and large transparent. Everything's out there. 
Every contract that's let, you can find information about who got that contract, how much it was, et cetera, et cetera. One thing that you also can do is to do research on your large business competitors, if you will. Those potential mentors that are out there that are in the same industry, you can find out who the top 10 uh, companies are nationally who do what you do, the bigs, and you can start to contact them. I think that that might be a really good way to go about it too. But again, be careful. Eunice, um, have you seen any or noticed any increases in joint venturing on NASA projects in the past six months or so? Yes. <laughs> there has been an increase in, in joint ventures and what's happened is this um, opened up a whole new world for us as far as, um, as it, an agency and for the contracting officers to examine. It is a, a, a new um, uh, new, it's new for us, so um, it's present, uh, presenting a little uh, challenge on how to evaluate proposals when we have joint ventures uh, being submitted. So, um, as Michelle said, is that making sure that you, when you're uh, bidding on your uh, to, on a proposal, to making sure that you have give the uh, evaluation team a clear understanding of your your uh, business arrangement because it is going to give us a, a better idea of whether or not you can perform the con on the contract and also your, your relationship with the government people that you're going to be required to work with for, for five years on that particular uh, contract. So we are getting increases in um, joint ventures. You know, so I have another question for you. I think this may be directed toward you. I'm not really sure, but I believe so. It says, how do you request professional services be added to the acquisition forecast? Oh, okay. The, the actually the um, the acquisition forecast is is uh, um, the projection from the technical people. So if there's something that you think that may not have been captured on the acquisition forecast, the best thing to do is to contact the small business specialist at the center. So what uh, what I do is I'm actually sending out um, information to our technical people to see what they project um, uh, that would, what they project that they're going to do. But the um, like I said, make sure to stay in touch with the small business specialist because the acquisition forecast is just a snapshot of what um, of what we projected we're going to do. So now we're entering into the fourth, or we're in the fourth quarter of the of the fiscal year, and funds become available. So there might be a project that that um, one of the um, organizations might have needed, and so that did, they may not have been gotten captured because when we do our acquisition forecast, we do it twice a year, and it's updated um, April the 30th and October the 30th of each year. So we're captured, uh, things are changing in between that time. So um, just make sure to stay in touch with your small business specialist and find out if there's anything else going on. And you know, so there's people in the webcast audience around the country, as far southwest as Arizona. Can you talk about some of the other uh, NASA centers? Because I'm not I'm personally not familiar with all the centers you have and um, whether there are small business specialists at each center around okay. the country. Okay, okay. Yeah, there, um, there are small business specialists at each center and on the website all of the small business specialists are identified their phone numbers and their email addresses. And then the other thing that the Office of Small Business Programs is we really want to reach out and help small businesses. So there is a mobile app that's available on your for your iPhone. Right now it's, there's a the um, iPhone, I'm sorry, the iOS platform, and then there will be an Android platform. On, on that uh, web, on that uh, app, you can uh, get in touch with the small business specialist. You can look at the active contract list for each of the centers. You can look at the uh, acquisition forecast on there, and there's a myriad of different things that are on there. And then also the Office of Small Business Programs will push through information that you think that you might be interested in. You know what I do want to add is a little bit something that's off the record is that we also have, uh, or off the questions I should say, is a NASA vendor database. If you're interested in doing business with, with NASA, register on that database because 
uh, other businesses also, that's another one that you can look at as far as large businesses, looking for small businesses to uh, subcontract with. There's two components to it. There's the, you put out your information, you will get push throughs on, uh, on um, uh, uh, procurements that are going through. Those are actually pushed out through that database. Um, and then also there's a subcontracting module on that database. So you can, so your information, so if you want to do business with someone and they've put their information on there, their point of contact information is there for you to uh, uh, get in contact with somebody if you're interested in it. Uh, John, is, yep. uh, so the, que the question is, is there a limitation on what an 8A protege can, ha can basically enter into a new mentor-protege relationship? For example, can a protege have a mentor in their last year of the 8A program? It looks like the question is, can we enter into a new mentor-protege relationship in the last year of the 8A program? The 8A program has a nine-year term. And I think the general answer is no, because we, we have to look at that. Why would you be entering in the last year? What developmental um, help is really going to be available to you in, in one year? I think we're going to be skeptical of that relationship. I believe the rules does say that uh, you need to be in the transitional, I mean, in the developmental stage of your 8A um, term which is within the first five years, but there are some exceptions to that rule, I would contact your SBA office and discuss it specifically, exactly what's happening there. And my understanding under the new rules is that that 8A relationship can actually be transferred into a small business program mentor-protege after the first year. So if the 8A, gra if there is a graduation, it could transfer to just to be a small business mentor-protege. Those are part of the new rules, and so it's, it, it's all new for everybody, you know, and they're new, new if, if we just went through the new rules, this would be a six-hour lunch <laughs> and dinner today. Well, and so, I guess uh, maybe the strategy right. there would be is if you're in your last year of the 8A program, why not go directly? into right, the all exactly. small mentor protege uh, program and not deal with the 8A piece of it. Right. Um, other questions um, from the audience, and I wanna, I wanna get into questions about prospective mentors and proteges. Um, but I had a question, let me see, I think this one for me, and then I have a few more for you all. Um, what about, are there any particular information we should know to get our SDVOSB certification? Um, so, guidance on getting certified as a service disabled veteran owned small business. Well, there's two, there's a self certification that goes on that you, you can self certify with the federal government or you could certify with the Department of Veterans Affairs. Other states and cities actually have certification processes as well. For instance, the state of California has a DVBE program that, a, that actually isn't about small business. Any veteran business can be a part of that DVBE program. It's very robust. It actually doesn't, it, you could be a large veteran-owned business and be a part of the program. But for federal contracting purposes, you either self-certify or you get through the CVE process with the Department of Veterans Affairs. Personally, I would go with the Department of Veterans Affairs because more likely than not you're going to, so you'll be vetted, more likely than not you'll withstand a bid protest, and you'll be entitled to work with the Department of Veterans Affairs and you get this preference as a veteran. So that's what I would do is get certified. But the eligibility criteria is virtually the same, whether you're going to self-certify or um, whether you're going to certify for the, for the, uh, through the CVE program for the Department of Veterans Affairs. And that is really 51% of, veteran, of veterans, a veteran, must own or control the company. So it could be veterans or veteran, but at least 51% ownership by a veteran or a service-disabled veteran. And so um, they're very similar to the woman-owned small business in terms of the eligibility criteria. The veterans must control the company, meaning legal control and operational control. Legal control means does that veteran has the ultimate legal authority to, um, to enter into binding contracts with the, with, for the company, to dissolve the company if it wants, I mean, and does it own its stock, 
for instance? Does it own its interests? Did it purchase its interests, or was it simply transferred in order to effectuate an SDVSB ownership? They want to see that the veteran purchased his, in, his or her interest in their firm, and that purchase needs to be real and substantial. So if a veteran is purchasing ownership interest in a company that's already doing $80 million a year and paid $500 for that interest, it will be scrutinized, right? But if the, the business is a startup business and it's simply a training company where the business only needs a computer to do you know, training over the web, then maybe $500 is sufficient startup capital. So uh, um, control is the same. They want to see daily operational control. They, don't want, they want to say, see that the veteran is really at the table and controlling the company. There is an exception. So, and, and that exception is if the service disabled veteran is truly is, is severely disabled and really cannot do the, 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 oper the daily operations. So for instance, they might be handicapped or they, I mean, they might be in a wheelchair and maybe they can't get out to the roof. So are, are they going to do a roof inspection? Is the, um, is the VA going to mandate that because they can't do a roof inspection that they don't truly control their company? The answer is no. So they make exceptions for caretakers to help out the service disabled veteran in the operations of their company and that makes sense, or other veterans can help out in the operations of a company. So those are the main factors. The VA actually has a, a very, pretty, very good website, and they, and they um, identify what ownership and control is, and they also identify the documents they want, they're going to want to see. And, and unlike other agencies, Either, either the SBA or throughout the United States that define, for instance, MBE and WBE, the VA goes a little bit further and they actually identify not only what documents they want to review, but why they're reviewing the documents. And that could give you some real insight as to what they, how they view ownership and control of a company, a veteran-owned company. Very good. Um, can, can I ask you a couple sure. questions? Oh, sure. I'm sure. Sure you can. It's only fair, right? <laughs> so, no, I, because you've worked with a lot of businesses, large and small, in the federal arena, uh, you, you know, you've seen a lot of these relationships already, and you've probably litigated a few of them. Um, if you were a small business wanting to be a protege and looking at a mentor, what kinds of questions would you be asking a potential mentor? So what I would ask the potential mentor is, are you doing federal work now? Because a lot of mentors are actually looking for small business protégés to get into the federal market. So they're actually using you and they want you to mentor them in the federal business world. <laughs> so ask what kind of project experience they have as a federal contractor, number one. And that what is the percentage of their revenues of federal contracting versus commercial projects? Maybe it's very small or maybe it's very large where they really know the federal contracting world. I would ask them what geographical locations that they work in or are interested in working in. Because if the mentor is in, uh, in uh, Wisconsin and you're here in Cleveland and the mentor only wants to work in Indiana and uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin, I don't think there's going to be a m much joint venturing going on with the two of you. So what are the geographical locations that they'll, they'll support? It, maybe you want to go all over the United States. Maybe you want to go work in Florida. Are they willing to go after a joint venture with you in Florida? So, um, and then I would ask about the project size. I found that some mentors don't even want to joint venture with you or assist you if the project size is under $10 million or $5 million. So what, what is their sweet spot? What is their project size? And then also, crucial question is, how actually are they charging for, you know, what does their overhead and profit look like? What is their structure? So for instance, if they're, if they're only, if you're charging 8% profit and overhead and profit, or 15%, and they want to charge 26%, there's going to be a problem, right? Because they want more money than you want. Mm -hmm. There's another issue. One, another issue in, in construction particularly is um, many contractors work in the commercial world and they have to be, belong to labor unions and unions. And a lot of small business contractors in the federal world aren't, aren't union. And so if there's a union, non-union, you've got a conflict, and more likely than not, that mentor is not going to want to put you on their commercial projects or do a lot of work with you. 
The other thing is, do you have past performance? Well, if they've been on federal projects, they have past performance, but what type of past performance? Mm -hmm. Do they have negative CPAR ratings? Mm -hmm. Do they have ratings that are bad that could actually, you know, nullify your um, bid proposal, and you can't get um, and you can't get a satisfactory, so you can't get to the competitive range because your joint venture mentor has got negative CPAR ratings. So I would ask about that. Ask what their bonding capacity is, and is it taxed if you're in construction? Maybe they've got bonding capacity of $40 million, but they might be maxed out already. So you can't go after projects together because they can't help you with your bonding capacity. What type of equipment do they have, and is it compatible to your equipment? What type of software, if you're going to be doing joint venturing together and you're going to manage projects together, do you have different software? They're never going to be able to talk to each other. And are you going to have to buy software just to, just to communicate and work with the mentor? Um, I would ask the mentor what types of technical assistance can they give. For instance, do they have extra seats from wherever, they, you know, uh, uh, basically a software seats. If they've got 100 licenses, they've only used 60 of them, you know, are they willing to, to, you know, further, to work with the company to further license to you? So maybe you can get a deal on software licensing. Um, what, um, have, has the mentor ever been terminated for default? Or is the mentor in, in the middle of any litigation right now that could really, really challenge their ability to even pay attention to you? Um, and then does the mentor have any current protégés? Okay, and who are they? And what kind of NA what NAICS codes are they performing work in? Has the mentor had past protégés? And how did that work out? Mm -hmm. Were they, were, you know, did it work out well? Are you able to talk to that protege and find out firsthand what the, how the protege feels about the mentoring experience? Um, and then also, do you anticipate any changes to ownership? So you might be in a mentor-protege relationship, and it's a family-owned business, and you really feel good about them, but you don't you didn't know after the first year that they had plans to sell their company. And guess what? The mentor-protege relationship you worked so hard is out because the new owners don't want to have anything to do with federal uh, government contracting. So those are a couple um, tips I would give in terms of asking your prospective mentors. And, and as you're asking those questions to the mentor, if they come back and don't ask any questions of you, <laughs> I think that should be a red flag because they're they need to have an interest in you and your development in the future or there is no future of that mentor-protege uh, relationship. Uh, many times over the years in the 8A program with the mentor-protege program, we have had to terminate those relationships because the promised assistance had never flowed down to the small business, in this case the 8A certified business. I have a few um, questions that are not necessarily about mentor protege, but they're from they're, they're SBA questions. Okay. Um, so, uh, do you have to be 8A certified to get assistance from the SBA? No, absolutely not. Um, any small business who's interested in federal government contracting can come to us, any district office of the SBA across the country, for assistance. Um, we do. For instance, once a month here in the Cleveland District, we do a general how to sell to the federal government briefing. It happens to be on the second Friday of each month at 10 o'clock here in Cleveland. I'm sure there are similar uh, issues uh, in, in other cities. And we do an awful lot of outreach into not just the core city where we're located, but all over our district at all times. And so women-owned business, veterans, uh, hub zone program we haven't talked too much about, but that's a, a program that the SBA administers. It is the historically underutilized business zone program. It has to do with where your business is located and where your employees are located. And there is a set aside availability for hub zone certified firms there. So the answer is you don't have to be 8A certified, but we do work very closely with our 8A certified firms. Another SBA question is, what is a certificate of competency? Certificate of com competency is, 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 is an interesting thing that comes up occasionally when you as the small business are the apparent awardee on a contract, but the contracting officer gets nervous. And they say that for whatever reason, financially or from a technical perspective, they don't think that you are capable of performing on the contract. If that would occur, the small business has the ability 
to request a certificate of competency, in which case um, SBA and other groups would look at your technical and financial capabilities and determine whether you actually had those capabilities. And if we issue the COC, Certificate of Competency, to the contracting officer, then that agency is obligated to go forward with the contract. Can a small business ask for a COC on its own, or is it the contracting officer that asks for it? Well, it, both? It, both, both can, can ask for it, but you cannot ask for it up front. Say, oh, we'll just take care of that up front, <laughs> and we'll get that covered so we don't have to worry about it. No, that doesn't happen. I've had that question a million times in my, in my career. Um, it only occurs, the opportunity for it only occurs if you are the apparent awardee, and for some reason the agency does not want to make that award to you. And um, another question is, what is a bona fide office, and can I have more than one, and how do I do that? A bona fide office, and typically only construction firms are going to be concerned about this, and it has to do with the 8A program, because if there is a 8A sole source um, construction contract, or an 8A competitive construction contract that's restricted to a certain geographic area, only those those eight, those uh, companies that are 8A certified in those areas can can get that, unless a company from outside that area has a bona fide office, frankly, a, a subsidiary office, a, a branch office, whatever you want to call it, that's in that location. Um, you have to petition as an 8A firm to the office that has jurisdiction over you to ask them to have the other office review your your location and then we'll go out and we'll take a look to make sure that you actually have an office there that's operating and we can grant the request for a bona fide office and then you may bid on geographically restricted 8a construction contracts in that new area where your office is located and get sole source set aside so you don't have just one bona fide office these are just a dish could be additional offices they're additional offices it's part of your it's part of your expansion, frankly, as a small business. Maybe you uh, see great opportunities to do construction in St. Louis and, and uh, you, you want to open an office there. So you can have multiple offices across the country, but we will, only in the case of 8A, uh, do an approval on those. Do you have any other questions? Or is there any other questions from the audience? You said that So the question is, um, I, I don't, I'm a small business, I don't, I'm doing it for the outside audience. I'm a small business and I don't want to do a joint venture with my mentor. I want to subcontract work to my mentor. Um, what is the limitations of subcontracting when I subcontract work to my mentor? Well, that's very interesting, a very good question. The limitations of subcontracting will still apply to your prime contract, whether, you, whether there's a mentor there or not. So, uh, but if your mentor, if you're subcontracting a large portion of the work and it's a vital and primary elements of that work, they will look, be looked upon as an ostensible subcontractor and you'll be a de deemed affiliated with your mentor. And that's why it's very important to think out that mentor-protege process, identify the types of things that the mentor is going to assist you with, and make sure it's included in your mentor-protege agreement so you will be, so if you're protested, the SBA will review that agreement, review what the mentor is doing under a particular prime, sub, prime subcontract relationship, and either a deem it acceptable or a non-acceptable and affiliation. Is there another question? Uh, if you're considered an affiliate, If, you, if your mentor and if the mentor and the protege did something to make themselves affiliated, um, uh, you know, because they have that exception, the SBA says that um, we will we find an exception to the S, the mentor protege relationship uh, of a, for affiliation. Okay, but 
affiliation could be found for other reasons. So if the SBA finds that you and the mentor are doing things inappropriate to the SBA program, they'll find an affiliation and they will deem you ineligible for award. And depending on the type of program you're in and the type of conduct that's being done, it could also expose the small business to decertification and possible, you know, in, you know, a further government investigation. Question? You are an 8 day joint venture, and um, in the commercial world, say a Home Depot um, uses you as a subcontractor, are there any limitations there? No. Um, when you're an 8 day contractor, that's regarding the federal program. So if you want to joint venture, let's say, with another small business or another business in a commercial project, then you're, you can't. Okay, you're, you're totally, but you need, need to find out from the, those supplier diversity programs, do they have any requirements on their joint venture? For instance, um, if Home Depot or Office Depot is going to give you credits as a WBE, Women Business Certified Firm, because you're certified through WeBank and, and their supplier diversity program, um, do they have any specific requirements for a woman-owned small business, I'm sorry, a woman-owned joint venture? However, you need to be very careful because a lot, I think a lot of small businesses believe that, well, I don't have any joint, uh, I only have one joint venture in the federal arena and it's with another small business, but I've got 18 joint ventures and, and with large businesses mm -hmm. in the commercial area, okay? So the SBA doesn't care. The SBA only cares about federal projects. That's not the case, especially if you're 8A certified because, uh, because the SBA says, you know, has their own definition of affiliation, exception from affiliation. And the SBA is not going to say, just because you're doing commercial projects, you're, you're not, with these large companies, you're not affiliated. Okay, so you have to really talk to your counselors, talk to the, uh, your SBA specialists, uh, your, your business, if you're 8A, your business opportunity specialist, to make sure you're compliant when you start reaching out to do commercial work. And the SBA, especially the 8A program, encourages you to go out, especially toward the mi middle part of your nine-year program, to go out seeking commercial projects. And at the end, so you have more commercial projects or more non-8A projects than 8A projects, because they don't want you dependent on the 8A program for revenues, especially after you graduate. Great question. Any other questions? Well, I think we're going to uh, adjourn like 15 minutes early, give you all the opportunity to maybe network amongst each other. Um, we want to thank you all in the audience so much for tuning in. I believe this uh, webcast is available on our website 24 hours. Right? So, um, and I want to thank my great panelists. I want to give them a, a round you. of applause. Thank you so much for your time and your invaluable information.